and we're going to start the recording here. Um, and start screen sharing. Okay. Um, so do, does anyone uh, have a uh, any comments on, on uh, building the causal loop diagram? Any uh, feedback from this? The loops? Okay. So in other words, the... Um, uh, the positive from the negative in the middle of the diagram there? Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, so uh, that uh, that will be something which we could actually illustrate on, on this diagram, which was sent by, uh, by one student. Um, and let me just uh, make sure. Uh, oh, okay. Um, mm, okay. Uh, let's see. So the remote student is having... Um, is reporting problems uh, with hearing here. Um, hmm. Oh, okay, okay, great. Um, glad to hear it. Uh, okay, so it's, it looks like we're going with gas now. So, uh, pardon me for the uh, the interruption there. Okay, so um, I, uh, I I thought we'd start with this diagram, and I'll try to use it. Uh, to, to address Kamalpreet's uh, question there as well, which is a more of a mechanical sort of uh, issue, issue of how to use the software. Um, so I think Kamalpreet was asking about um, um, annotating the diagram uh, to indicate a loop. To decide which polarity. Oh, which is uh, to decide, to identify which is the polarity. I see. Um, okay, so uh, the rule that we articulated last time about uh, polarities was successively extended um, from a uh, single polarity uh, of, of a single um, link, single connection, to several connections um, in turn, for example. And then ultimately we argued that um, if you can reason about the polarity associated with a pathway between two nodes that are separated by one or more links, you can reason out the polarity associated with a loop. Okay, So um, if here we have A is connected to B with a plus polarity, B is connected to C with a minus polarity, um, for example, I argued that um, uh, we can think of the entire pathway from A to C as being associated with what sort of polarity? Anyone? Sorry? Negative or positive? Ne negative, that's right. Um, and the basic uh, reasoning here was as follows. Um, so what, what, can anyone remind us what's the meaning of a, of a positive polarity, a plus associated with a link? Okay, okay, so an increase in A would lead to an increase in B, but we actually um, we actually want to be a little bit more precise than that in a lot of cases uh, for two reasons. Um, one thing is that it's easy if you just say an increase in A to get confused about whether you're talking about uh, an increase in A over time, so it's, it's going up over time, or whether we're talking about an increase in A compared to some reference value. Okay, um, so in other words, if it if it has a higher value than it otherwise would have, and it's the second meaning we hear we, we, we mean here. So it's if if A increases if if A were to 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 have a higher value, I'm not saying it's going up over time. It's just saying if A is to have a higher value um, than than some reference value, then B will tend to be higher than it otherwise would have been. So if A had been lower, B would have been lower. If A is higher, B is now higher. Okay? This is important because it doesn't necessarily mean um, that A is going up over time. And if A is higher, it doesn't mean that B is going up over time. 
it just means if A is has a relatively higher value than some reference point, then B will tend to have a relatively higher value than some reference point. They're monotonically related, you know, an increase in A uh, the relative to some reference uh, will lead to an increase in B. Now, okay, so that's good. Now, suppose we have this connection for B to, to C. What is that telling us? Okay. Yeah. Okay, compared to the value it otherwise would have had. So, so the, the full terminology I use here, which may initially sound overly wordy, but really it packs a lot that addresses some commentaries. Um, we use the terminology, you know, so let's say A to B. If A were to increase, if A is higher, um, then B will be higher compared to the value it otherwise would have had all other things being equal. Okay? If all other things are equal. So, and, and here, as you're saying, it's saying that B is higher. So if we have, and um, I'll, I'll just use another diagram so those attending remotely can see this. Um, if, we, uh, if we were to draw this out in Vensim, um, first of all, I might use uh, this notation rather than the, the levels that seem to be consistently used by some of the diagrams I saw. So A, B, C. And if we were to draw this connection here and another connection here, A, come on, um, I overshot, boom. Um, and then we're to label these with a minus and we're to label these with a minus. Um, good practice, by the way, to label them at the handle because sometimes when you label them close to the end, they all cluster and it's kind of hard. They're all coming together and it's hard to see which is which. But here, if you label it in the middle, so how did I do that? I did um, position polarity at the handle. It's a little bit clearer. Okay, so if we're reasoning about this, if A increases compared to value it otherwise would have had, B will be higher compared to the value it otherwise would have had. If B increases compared to value it otherwise would have had, C would tend to be lower than the value it otherwise would have had, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, so the net effect would be, okay, if A were to increase, then compared to a value it otherwise would have had, then B would tend to be higher than the value it otherwise would have had, and then C would tend to be higher compared to the value it otherwise would have had. Of course, all of the things being, it would be lower, so C is lower, so it's an increase in A relative to its reference value would tend to C being lower than it, it would have been, right? So the net effect of this, of A to C, is, is a net negative polarity pathway. If A increases compared to value it otherwise would have had, then C will tend to be lower compared to the value it otherwise would have had. So net negative sort of implication of that entire pathway. Now, if it so happens, ladies and gentlemen, that, that in fact, C is A, that, in fact, you know, we, we take this and we simply wrap it round like, like that and we separate them. Um, so we have a negative. Oh, hey, no, come on. Um, there we go. No. Um, man. Uh, okay, refresh, refresh. Um, there we go. Um, then we have a net negative feedback because the pathway would have been negative if, if you know, all we've done is we've taken that same pathway and bent it around so C is A. And that pathway, that entire pathway, A to B to A, has a net negative polarity by the reasoning we just went through. Does that make sense? Now, in terms of labeling it, and I thought your question involved this, but I don't think it did. Uh, use this this uh, comment feature up here, and you can use this image, and then you can say um, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. In this case, it's it's clockwise, so we could have a value like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, the short short answer here is it's the rule of signs. You just multiply the signs to 
remove negatives, cancel. And so if you have an odd number of negatives within that pathway, it's net negative. Um, in practice, it's good to, to make sure that the diagram has some validity. It's good to reason it through step by step and make sure that each step along the way you're comfortable with it. Um, and and uh, and then you can and then you can reason about it. You know, make sure it's it's consistent. That yes, it's with with the labeling. So does that help help address a little bit of that? Okay. So any other comments on um, sort of the experience of building a causal loop diagram before I go into one example sent to me? Again, people are welcome to send me along diagrams here. Zip. So if you want me to try to look at them up here on the stage. Mm -hmm. well, okay, so here's a, here's a diagram. This diagram has many pieces. And first exercise I'd like to go through and and uh, like I said, this looks like a really interesting diagram. So a lot, a lot of uh, issues uh, that are um, pertinent to the current time. If anyone has checked out Google flu trends, we're, we're just, I think, starting to decrease from a, uh, from a flu peak. You know about flu trends out there? Yeah, Google, yeah, you can go see what it's like in Saskatchewan or what it's like in Ontario. Um, so there's a lot of current things here. But um, let's start to sort of piece out what's going on here. Um, so one thing I look at a diagram like this, uh, first thing I'll do, and this is things that carry over to my markers often, is I'll look and uh, see, OK, um, uh, what sort of uh, variables do we have? Are all of them ordinal in character? What do I mean by ordinal? Yeah. So the order of them, one is greater than or less than another, right? We could put them on an ordering, impose an ordering on them. Maybe they're not equally spaced or whatever. We can at least impose an ordering. Um, and that's what I referred to last time as sort of an issue of the variable should have polarity, you know, the cert, a, a, a confident sense of what's more and what's less, right? So let's, let's take a look at these things. Um, so... Um, some of these are, are very readily uh, associated with um, polarity. So prevalence of flu in network, how common flu is, and in particular, sort of what fraction of people have flu. Is, is that ordinal? We say more or less of that? Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, awareness and education. Is that, is that ordinal? Well, we could... We could interpret it that way. It's kind of being level of awareness or education, right? Um, but that that involves kind of reading reading some things into it. So I would actually argue that a uh, you know uh, a better way to put it might be level of or degree of awareness slash education, the degree to which people are. So it's not just education as a as a process or something like that, um, but it's sort of degree of education. Okay, fear of side effects. Yeah, you could say I'm, I'm more afraid or I'm less afraid, right? Um, uh, get flu vaccination. Um, okay, that sounds like an action to me. And actually, we'll be seeing some types of modeling where there's a lot of attention to, to actions that occur in particular events. I think what is probably meant here would be propensity to get flu vaccination or inclination to get flu vaccination or, or likelihood of getting flu vaccination. It could mean it, it's, you know, um, flu, it could be uh, uh, level uh, or, or uh, frequency of flu vaccination or sort of amount of flu vaccination going on, something like that. But this would need to be uh, clarified. So, you know, um, flu vaccination, um, uh, participation in flu vaccination, participation in flu vaccination. Maybe it means something like that. I'll just conjecture. Um, okay, available supply of vaccines. That's pretty clearly ordinal. 
out-of-pocket payment, yeah. Public coverage, um, maybe degree of public coverage, um, sort of, or level of public coverage, something along those lines. Um, belonging in, in target high-risk group, um, so, uh, so uh, this might be weather, uh, weather belongs to. It's hard to, um, so, uh, well, okay, I, I can kind of understand that. So you might say it's binary, dichotomous, can either be uh, you are or not in it, and you are is a higher value than, than not. So we code it as one and zero or something like that. Um, historical behavior, um, uh, that, that's not so clear to me that that's ordinal. Like saying, this person has more historical behavior than another. Maybe it means um, level of, um, of participation. And, um, so uh, uh, level of vaccination participation in, uh, in historical um, level of historical vaccination participation. Something, maybe something along those lines would be a little bit clearer. Um, so that would be now more clearly ordinal. So we could say, if it goes up, what is this? Does it affect this guy in a plus or minus? Um, okay, so I've just gone through and sort of checked some of these variables. Um, and I, I'm not positive I've interpreted them correctly, but um, uh, they, um, you know, there's there's been um, some interpretation of them. Now let's let's think some about what's depicted in terms of the the uh, connections between them, because we've been kind of focusing on them in isolation. Okay, so let's talk about, for example, um, uh, this participation in flu vaccination, which is quite central here. Okay, um, so if that grows up, goes up, the idea is um, that uh, it will affect certain things. So one thing in the lower right is it will tend to lower the available supply of, of vaccines, right? So if people get vaccinated more, they're, they're using up a, a dose of vaccine and getting vaccinated. They're using up a, 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 a aliquot of vac uh, vaccine or what have you, and and so there's less supply afterwards. And so we have a, a negative feedback associated with depletion of a vaccine stock here. You have more of this, it leads to less available supply, and eventually that will impact participation, right? As we saw here, they had to close down flu clinics for the general public at some point because of the shortage of, of, of uh, flu vaccine then they had to shut it down for everyone, and then they, you know, restarted it. Okay, so, so there's some depletion here. Um, arguably, there should be a, a delay associated with this. Um, let's see if we can, by right-clicking on this, maybe I want to put a delay mark in, because it's uh, sometimes, you know, we would have to take quite a lot of participation to really... Um, well, uh, but for excuse me, for available supply to start cons constraining participation, um, um, that's uh, yeah, that's somewhat true. So, so if the supply changes, it takes some time for people to perceive it at the least, or it takes some time for it to to really uh, have an effect. I'd have to think about that a little bit. That's an interesting one. There is some perception delay. I don't know if it. Should be that long. Okay, let's continue on. Um, so here we have this. What else can it affect? Okay, participation in flu vaccination, it says, um, can affect prevalence of flu in network with a negative, uh, a negative polarity. So um, are people comfortable with that? The more people get vaccinated, the fewer, the lower the prevalence is going to be eventually. Eventually, it's not going to be an instantaneous thing. You could get a thousand people vaccinated right now, and both for biologic reasons, their body doesn't develop immune responses, and for sociologic reasons, they're not going to be circulating such that they're going to instantly otherwise get infected. So it, it would affect prevalence, but maybe two weeks out, three weeks out, four weeks out. Okay, so that that makes sense. And prevalence of flu and network. Um, 
Uh, okay, now this is the interesting one. This is this is uh, where the plot thickens. Um, so prevalence of flu in network leads to greater propensity for participation in flu vaccination. Can anyone give me a sort of theory underlying that? Why why would why this connection here? Fear. Yeah, risk perception. Yeah, sense of fear, concern that you might get vaccinated. So there's a a negative feedback here governing. So see with risk perception, you know, we change our behavior if it looks more risky and we relax our behavior if it doesn't look so risky. And this, this model, capturing a dynamic hypothesis, sort of one, um, one interpretation of, of how things work in the world is that that, that loop lies, um, lies uh, at issue here. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, let's talk about more of these things. Prevalence of flu in network to degree of awareness education. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so people will tend to search more information out on flu, tend to try to find out more information. What is this H1N1 flu? Um, am I at risk? Um, who's specially at risk? Should I be especially careful because I have a chronic disease? That's something um, that might lead to awareness here, and that in turn might lead to participation. In flu vaccination, right? Yes. I would argue that awareness and education should be split up. Ah. There's a lot of misinformation mm. that circulates about vaccines, mm. um, particularly with the flu vaccine. Mm. Um, there's a myth that if you get the vaccine, you're actually more likely to get the flu and things like Gosh. that. Gosh. Okay. Wow. So I would say people might be aware, but have education that actually. Okay. Oh. Okay, so that's interesting. So the idea is that maybe this awareness, um, uh, that we want, might want to unpack them into two pieces. One is sort of awareness and, and you know, being in their mind, you know, mind share of it. And another issue is the degree to which they're well-educated about it, right? Um, and different processes might affect uh, each um, and that's, that's intriguing. There might be some parallel structure in the sense that prevalence of flu in the network might lead to more awareness because people all around you are sneezing and coughing, but it also might lead to more propensity to become educated. But then there's gonna be some differences between them um, as well, like this fear of side effects would f feed more into, uh, into sort of issues of uh, of, of uh, maybe mind uh, potentially potentially uh, lessening of education, something along those lines. Um, Even just an article with CDC about awareness of Saskatchewan flu is regarding suggesting that vaccinated people should be vaccinated against the flu. Mm. Um, but it was mm. Right. Okay. So that's that's really uh, interesting. So fear of side effects. Um, there's a key question. If we were to divide this into two parts, um, and kind of, uh, I'll, I'll keep the aesthetics here. So you know, we might divide this up into degree of awareness, um, and then a separate. Um, uh, degree of, of education or, or um, um, something something uh, uh, something along those lines and it's it's almost tempting once you get into so many degrees to just make it awareness and education level for you know um, uh, but we could we could unpack those and and then we would have prevalence um, you know, uh, leading to degree of awareness uh, here, but um, uh, and and so that's uh, that's with confidence. But awareness might also lead to um, so that might also lead to uh, a participation in flu vaccination. But degree of education would also now one type of relationship that this sort of diagram doesn't capture well is mediation. So if Degree of awareness would lead to participation if you are educated. There's there's no real nice way of of capturing that. Um, 
that uh, interaction. You could create a separate variable that would uh, try to capture effects of both. But um, you know, this awareness might be um, might be linked here. But um, uh, another way to do it would be to put a variable here, which is you know, fear of side effects. Um, Okay, so maybe something like this, where, where degree of education would lower fear of side effects. If you had a high fear of side effects, this is getting awfully crowded, so let's, uh, let's go drag this and, and break this up. Something like this. Um, oh, man. Uh, okay, um, that bought us a little bit of space. Um, so now we have degree of awareness. Since we don't have a mediation relationship, we might have something like this. Um, uh, fear of side effects. Um, a degree of awareness would feed fear of side effects. And, and then um, that, might, that does indeed lead to lowering the, um, uh, might lead to lowering of that. So. We, we could have something like this, um, but this would tend to counteract that education here. And education would tend to lead to participation in, um, in flu vaccination. So this degree of education um, would be something now which certain things might affect that might not affect awareness, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm just looking over here. Um, one challenge I know for many people, if we were to try to elaborate, now we're getting into the stage of elaboration, is that socioeconomic status does lead to um, degree of education about these matters. So um, uh, this is a, an undeniable fact. Often those who are higher, more wealthy, have, have access to more resources, um, can more readily um, get, get reliable information. Um, a lot of it otherwise can sometimes be hearsay or et cetera. So we have socioeconomic status, you know, that, that helps participation both through, through socioeconomic supports, uh, you know, being able to afford out-of-pocket payment and, um, and uh, issues with degree of education, uh, you know, by uh, enhancing education. Um, and so degree of awareness here Oh, we should have prevalence of flu in network. Um, mm, mm. Um, this might um, lead to degree of education. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure. Prevalence of flu that might, might just directly. So here we have, um, trying to tease out some of these relationships in a more, uh, more, more thorough the uh, theory. What other things might be uh, provided, um, might, might be connections we want to make here? Um, so can anyone else suggest, um, suggest elements that, uh, that might, um, might need to be added? In general, I think this is a pretty good diagram. So one thing is like socioeconomic status to degree of education. This might occur via two pathways. One would be um, uh, access to to uh, to educational, uh, you know, uh, propensity or uh, association with education, a, a history of education. Um, but a second thing is access to uh, online services and uh, and other resources that are harder for someone who, who doesn't have a smartphone or doesn't have access to computers to access. And so there's, there's uh, some particular pathways which could in fact be mediated by some policy effects. You know, you could, you could lessen the digital divide and potentially have a better effect on a uh, degree of, of education here. Um, I would say socioeconomic status and convenience often interact as well because um, if it needs to be pretty darn convenient for someone without a car to be able to access it, for example. And so there may be, there's a mediating effect here where, um, you know, convenience is, is, or at least maybe moderating, where 
the the impact of convenience is moderated by social socioeconomic stat status. The more uh, the greater your socioeconomic status, the more perhaps you're able to hop in a car or have recourse to recourse uh, to, to resources that would let you get vaccinated. And um, uh, this this could be broken out in a separate variable, um, which would be uh, you know ability to to participate affected by both socioeconomic status and, and convenience. So something like this. Um, so, uh, you know, um, uh, accessibility of vaccination, um, we might want to, uh, we might want to break that out and, and I'm gonna, maybe this is not the only pathway by which this uh, affects things, but accessibility of vaccination, that's affected by convenience. Um, and so the higher, the more convenient it is, the greater, greater accessible it is, um, and therefore the more likely to participate. Oops, um, hey, come on, boom. Um, so the more convenient, the more accessible, and, and then similarly, the accessibility uh, enhances participation, uh, but the other component of this is uh, socioeconomic status might, might, adverse, might uh, affect uh, accessibility of vaccination by, by virtue of, uh, of limiting the um, poor individual's um, uh, ability to, to seek out vaccination. Let me just uh, see. Was it a uh, okay? Nothing there. So, um, so here we have a um, a theory with a, a couple more variables in it, and I think it has sharpened it some. Um, uh, it may be that fear of awareness, fear of side effects, also leads to degree of awareness. You know, in the sense that people start, there's a buzz about it, but potentially it also, by the same token, leads to adversely affecting education, in the sense that you have myths circulating about it. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So, quite right. Quite right. That was sort of uh, a vestigal, uh, vestigial sort of thing. And so it may be that we have something like this, that, that if you're in a high-risk group and, and there's warnings given and so on, you're more likely, oops, um, to, uh, to, to, be, uh, uh, to, to be aware. Okay. Um, fear of side effects might lead to um, spread, spread of misinformation or something like that. Um, and spread of misinformation might um, might lead to so spread of misinformation from fear of side effects and spread of misinformation in turn might enhance fear of side effects in the sense that you have uh, the rumor mill and it, and it tends towards sometimes more extreme claims or something like that. So there's this um, interaction there and of course degree of education might lower, well, it interacts already through um, fear of side effects um, here. So, and, but similarly, degree of awareness, well, also interacts maybe through fear of side effects, leads to spread, so we don't need a direct connection. One of the, one of the uh, questions that you should have when building a diagram like this is, you know, if I think about connect and say degree of awareness up to spread of misinformation, does it independently affect it other than through fear of side effects? Or does sort of the impact of degree of awareness on spread of misinformation, is that kind of mediated by fear of side effects? And, or is, it, is, is, is fear of side effects, um, is it acting through fear of side effects, to use a more familiar term to you? Um, that, and that's something that's a little bit subtle here. But um, what, what can be seen here is that we are articulating a theory that's um, fairly qualitative in nature here. We're capturing, we're talking about types of phenomena that are more or less undeniable that things, that things occur, the spread of misinformation, fear of side effects, degree of awareness. 
but we haven't yet unpacked it into quantified terms, right? This isn't something which, um, which is, um, which is a, a fully simulatable model. However, given what I said last time, I'm going to um, save this so uh, we can uh, we could uh, talk about it uh, next time uh, or talk about it at, at some other point. Uh, one thing that, that we could talk about is rough qualitative behaviors uh, associated with these um, uh, with these uh, types of, of loops, for example. So where are some notable loops here? Well, we, we commented on some of them. So one would be, for example, this one involving uh, available supply of vaccines and participation, right? And here we have a negative feedback loop and... Is the loop counterclockwise? Yes. Um, the loop is counterclockwise here. Okay. Um, so we have some depletion effects here. Um, here we have uh, a loop that, again, is, is negative in character. We have a loop associated with risk perception uh, associated with this. So flu, you know, people, if flu is at low prevalence, people say, why well, go get vaccinated, right? Um, why is it such a priority for you around people around me that that it put, put me at risk? The chance is very low. Why should I get vaccinated? So there's a negative feedback associated with that. It's associated with risk perception. Then there's some positive feedbacks um, associated with some effects. And this sort of spread of, of misinformation, I think, is is one of them. Um, oh, hey, those who work in the area tell me that. Uh, there's you know whole communities that form and, and sort of uh, uh, a, a very active sort of rumor mill that can form about uh, side effects of vaccines. So um, is this a um, this is a counterclockwise one as well? Um, excuse me. Ooh, that's a positive feedback. Um, now often what's done for best practices is to label give short labels to uh, feedback loops uh, involved in this. Um, so, so we might label, uh, you know, this, this, uh, uh, this loop here, why worry, you know, um, uh, or, or uh, uh, risk perception or something. This one here would be associated with draining the supply. Have I labeled all loops in this diagram? No. I have not. Um, there are some loops which are composites of the loops I have mentioned. For example, this one here. Um, uh, this one is a is a virtuous. Uh, well, it's actually a, it's not a virtuous cycle. It's a cycle associated with um, with uh, you know education is driven by by. Um, uh, Education is driven by a prevalence, and so prevalence in education enhances participation, which lowers prevalence. So people's education levels about flu get sort of regulated. It's a self-regulatory system where, you know, uh, they're just educated enough to, to keep it at, at low enough levels that not everyone is getting sick. And... You know, if it goes above that, they get more educated and it comes down eventually. Because if, if, if it goes to really low levels, people become complacent and don't learn about flu and, and get whacked on the side of the head and then finally get around to learning. So this is a kind of grim picture, but it's probably it's not that far off, particularly when it comes to childhood infectious diseases. I don't know if you know the situation there, but for decades and decades, we controlled these things very well. And then... People started to get very lax, and now we're seeing outbreaks of measles and mumps, et cetera, in, in, in young adults, precisely because people get very complacent, right? Um, it's, it's like people come to question the value of fire drills and safe, fire safety regulations. There's been no fire here in a long time. You know, um, no one's died from any fires. What injuries have there been from fires? And, and you know, why do we need these fire extinguishers on the walls? Um, but part of the reason, part of the reason they're there is to prevent fires. And so, if they're successful, it tends to lead to people questioning their benefits. As one article put it, 
uh, in the system dynamics literature, no one ever got credit for putting out fires that never happened. I'll repeat that again. No one ever gets credit for putting out fires that never happened. Because what do you compare it to? Those of you going into IT will observe that six very successful people in IT behind the scenes in businesses and so on, sometimes it's a kind of um, underappreciated task. Because when everything is going smoothly, people don't, don't why are all you IT guys around? Why are all IT gals around? I mean, what's, why, do we, why do we need you? You know, things are humming along smoothly. It's really when things go bad that, that people get, get noticed, right? And this can lead to perverse things in projects whereby sometimes people who want to be heroes secretly hope something will go wrong so they can come in and save the day. It's the firefighters, not the people that prevent fires, that get sometimes the credit. Um, so you know, here we have negative feedbacks, for example, involving um, this prevalence and degree of education that are a somewhat grim comment on the human condition, but probably, probably pretty accurate in terms of uh, certainly for childhood infectious diseases. Um, uh, it, it's played out, but the time frames are long, and, and uh, the creator of this diagram was quite accurate to put in, for example, a long time frame along here, and um, and fundamentally, like with childhood infectious disease, it, it played out over decades before people got really, really relaxed. Unfortunately, with HIV AIDS, it's been less with risk perception, you know, with uh, ARVs um, supporting people to live longer some of the perceived uh, risks associated with uh, HIV AIDS have, have been, uh, been greatly relaxed. Um, um, so um, diagrams, and a, a nice, uh, a very nice uh, start. Um, one issue here that I would say could be further improved would be, uh, you could label the loops, that would be great. Another thing would be to um, to, to not use stocks for all of these. So we're going to talk about stocks and flows uh, within this lecture. And um, what's these boxes connote in system dynamics language, even in these sort of diagrams, a stock. And we're going to talk about the meaning of a stock. And one of the things you'll find is that not all the things here on the diagram are, in fact, um, stocks. For example, participation in flu vaccines Flu vaccination is not a um, not a stock, and uh, we'll want to be able to delineate those sorts of variables. Um, so, uh, my own preference aesthetically, and uh, because of this distinction, would be if you don't want to distinguish something as to whether it's a stock or flow, that you use these variables here, and, and you just put it without a without a box. Okay, but overall, quite uh, quite good. Um, uh, there are some other uh, small things uh, that are more subtle, such as reference values associated with um, prevalence over which people start to get worried, some sort of thresholds for risk perception, but, um, and, and those could be put in. But overall, I thought it was a very nice diagram. Anyone have another diagram that uh, you'd like me to look at right now before we go on to stocks and flows? Yes. Okay. Did you send it to me? I sent it. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll go um go check here. So pardon me for just a second. Um, I'll go uh, have a look. Great. So uh, this is coming in here, and uh, terrific. Okay. And there we go. Okay. Oh wow! Okay, so uh, I'll switch back to the um, to to this. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, so here we have a diagram which is composed of uh, a variety of, of pieces, and it exhibits uh, it exhibits some uh, explicit stocks and flows, as well as some. Uh, some uh, feedbacks and, and elements of a causal loop diagram. And in general, we, we term a diagram like this a uh, system structure diagram because it includes uh, both uh, stocks flows and, uh, and uh, elements of causal loops in the form of link polarities. 
and some variables where it's not um, um, where the stop and flow um, mechanism is not ex very very explicitly followed. So antenatal anxiety, etc. Um, so let's let's take a look at, at some of this, and then I think we'll we'll get to the issue of of stocks and flows. We'll start talking about it. Okay. Um, okay. So um, broadly, we have a uh, sort of a a spine of this diagram going from um, progressive levels, I think, of um, oh, it's pro progressive timings uh, associated with depression. So antenatal, so before birth, uh, after birth, and then um, concurrent uh, depression. Uh, yeah, so this is longer term, sort of uh, at the time of, of, of childhood. And and there's some factors that are affecting this. For example, health seeking behavior, seeking out care, is lowering the likelihood of concurrent depression. Um, and uh, and uh, there's some impacts on the child as well. So uh, depression can lead to less childhood development. And, um, and postpartum depression can lead to uh, adverse effects on the development of mother mother infant um, bonding and so on um, and uh, and there's further a, um, a potential for multiple pregnancies uh, associated with another sort of bout of, of antenatal depression and so on so there's a, a, a feedback there of sorts um, which uh, which is uh, which can lead to sort of multiple children for example um, getting uh, getting involved in and, and the mother uh, the mother's depression adversely affecting them. So stressful life events can affect antenatal anxiety, um, and postpartum can, depression can contribute to that, and that um, can lead to antenatal depression here in the context of presumably of a, of a later pregnancy. So you might be recovering from one pregnancy in the first year, and and, and this affects your likelihood of having antenatal depression for later, for for a, 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 with respect to another child. I think, yeah. Um, and and then there's some things here. Odds of developing uh, uh, antenatal depression through uh, lack of social support, um, et cetera. Okay, so um, this is uh, very interesting. I was wondering, sorry, about that link between uh, anger, guilt, postpartum depression on the right side of the right bottom. Uh, okay, so... Uh, so oh, oh, anger and guilt, yes, right. Right. Um, well, it's so that's a, a good question. Um, here we have uh, anger and guilt associated with that mother, um, and so there may be uh, sort of recrimination uh, about, about one's own sort of uh, blaming oneself and so on, and so it may worsen that mother infant bond, and that leads it to uh, you know the the infant. Uh, mother relationship frame even further and leading to further. So I would expect it to be a, 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 a reinforcing loop, a loop which emphasizes, you know, which is unstable and, and drives it further, further out. And what that would imply is, is um, an even number of, of, um, of uh, negative polarity, uh, negative polarity lengths, and that's indeed the case. So here a mother and from uh, bond, if that's stronger, that would lead to lower anger uh, guilt. So, so again, in this diagram, it would benefit from having polarity, uh, you know, a clear clear names to 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 uh, make clear the polarity or the ordering. So, mother infant interaction bond, I would say, um, strength of mother infant interaction bond, stronger that is, the lower the anger and guilt. So, level of anger uh, anger and guilt. And then level of anger, guilt, um, the, the, the stronger that is, the greater the chance of postpartum depression. And then the greater chance of postpartum depression, the, uh, the, greater, uh, the lower the, um, the um, strength of the mother-infant uh, mother interaction and bond. Um, so I would put labels, and I won't, I won't do it here for interest of time, but I would put labels as to, um, to, to clearly connote the... Uh, 
the ordering or the, you know the, the ordinal nature of these, the the fact that they have a, a higher and lower value. So um, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, putting things like um, strength of mother uh, mother child interaction and bond and um, and uh, so strength of and then level of anger and guilt, something like that. Okay. Um, so I, I like that actually very much. This thing here needs to be un, uh, thought through a little bit because we've got this this sort of um, uh, trying to capture a an interaction between multiple pregnancies, but it's not it's not quite um, not quite uh, hitting hitting uh, it in the right way, and so we would have to uh, think about how to how to um, capture that well. Um, it might be there's a likelihood of another pregnancy and therefore greater chance of antenatal depression instead or something like that, rather than rather than breaking out as sort of a, a pregnancy here going in this other um, uh, in this other direction. But uh, that's that's quite uh, quite interesting. Um, and some of these other factors here add a lot to the the narrative here. Um, so the, the relationship with partner, lack of social support, um, contributed to the chance of a pregnancy and therefore maybe a chance of antenatal depression, as well as directly to the antenatal depression, something like that. So um, uh, there's some aspects of vulnerability that might that might feed into chance of pregnancy and and particularly unwanted pregnancy. So these this unwanted pregnancy, I would say, that might be related to poor relationship with partner um, from from down there. So look for look for links between variables that aren't explicit in these sort of diagrams. Okay. So those are some um, comments on two causal loop diagrams. They're by no means comprehensive, but Hopefully, it gives you some sense as to how I might approach them. Um, if you look at the, one of the reference books for the class, it's a book by Sturman called Business Dynamics. It has some wonderful causal loop diagrams in it that span a whole wide range of areas, from ecology to issues having to do with city planning, to issues having to do with business, running businesses, to issues having to do with um, uh, with, with health issues. So that, that book is worth the reference if you're interested, uh, worth the look if you're interested in causal loop diagrams. It is uh, a good chapter, a uh, really good chapter on causal loop diagrams. Um, I think it's chapter five. So, okay. So those are some comments on causal loop diagrams. Um, uh, are there any questions about causal loop diagrams before I go on and I introduce stocks and flows? Hmm? Okay. Um, so we're going to um, to change uh, topics here then, and um, it's not a um, it's not a, a, a total uh, change of topic, but um, it it's going to extend, refine, sharpen some of the intuitions we've been building up with causal loop diagrams, and ultimately even start to provide the foundation for explaining why those dynamic behaviors that I pointed to heuristically associated with each type of loop um, come, uh, emerge from those loops. Okay. Why, we see, why we see a sort of uh, convergent behavior to some equilibrium with a negative feedback loop. Why we see unstable behavior accelerating deviation and instability with a, um, a reinforcing loop. Let's talk, though, about some issues with causal loop diagrams to motivate this. Um, there's, uh, there's some shortcomings that can result. Sometimes uh, some of the most common ones are listed here. Many of them can be dealt with by, uh, by uh, careful uh, curation of the diagrams. But these are some ones that I often see in student, student, um, uh, student causal loops. So unclear variables. Diagrams can become very large. Confusion regarding polarity. We talked about that. Non-causal relationships, like imagine you had a diagram um, involving sleep disorders. A lot of students suffer sleep sleep challenges, and and you have um, 
uh, amount of time spent sleeping, amount of time awake. If you have those as two variables, there's not a truly causal physical relationship between the two. Instead, it's a definitional relationship. The amount of time that you're awake is kind of time of the day minus the time you're asleep. And so um, to put a link between the two, you might say time awake has a negative link to time asleep. Right? The more time I'm awake, the less time I'm asleep, and, and vice versa. And then you might think there's a positive feedback between them. And there ain't no positive feedback because it's not a causal connection. One doesn't cause the other in a, in a, in a physical sense to, to change, to become lower than the value it would have had. It's a definitional sense. They're two sides of the same coin. And so you don't want to link those up and think you can reason about those in the same way. An important point that we're going to get to now is that um, conservation is not always captured with them. You can't capture the fact that people are in either one state or another or another. They're just variables. And it's not, not as easy to, to capture those sort of uh, factors. Um, and some of the semantics of the... Um, of the implications are not uh, not not clear here. Um, so um, we're going to be introducing a mechanism using stocks and flows, um, which has mathematical precision, which builds on causal diagrams but lends them greater sharpness. And the uses of stocks and flows is traditionally quite um, uh, a distinctive feature of system dynamics. And compared to, for example, agent-based modeling, where we'll be spending comparatively more time in this class, it's a really distinguishing feature that speaks to the priorities system dynamics places on uh, working with diverse stakeholders and addressing people from all different backgrounds. Um, and it's one that's characterized by a small vocabulary that's used in highly creative ways. By the vocabulary, I mean predominantly stocks and flows, and then some variables that are kind of shorthands for formulas or constants and those sort of things, table functions, which, which are basically functions that you can define numerically. Um, and so uh, here, we have a small model of vocabulary, but the power really lies in combinations, clever combinations of these small number of elements. Um, and um, you're conducting analysis predominantly in terms of the elements. So you're looking at the behavior of stocks or behavior of flows um, as, as key parts onto it. And it directly maps onto a mathematical description. As we'll see with agent based modeling, we have a much larger modeling of vocabulary. We don't have a crisp way of describing it mathematically yet, but we have, um, at least that, that's used as part of the models. We may describe it separately, but it's not used in the specification of the model. Um, we use different subsets of vocabulary of agent-based modeling for different models, and uh, the power is, lies in flexibility combination of, of elements. Um, and uh, here, in agent-based modeling, we'll be dealing with a much larger set of, of, of different primitives. Okay, let's talk about stocks and flows. So what are stocks? Stocks in system dynamic modeling go by many different names. They go by levels by state variables, by compartments. They denote, ladies and gentlemen, accumulations. They denote quantities which accumulate or are drained over time and which, which represent some real-world pool or, or aggregation or, or uh, ac accumulation which changes, rises, and falls uh, over time. And they, they represent the state of the system. They capture the current status of the system. So it might be the number of people who are susceptible, infected, and recovered. Think about that first model we built in that agent-based model. Um, but we, we had each person is in one of those states. Here we'd be talking about, okay, people in the population are in either a susceptible category, infected category, or recovery category. And those change over time as people get infected, people recover. but at any given point, there's the, the state of the system can be described as how many people are susceptible, how many are infected, how many recover. That specifies the state of the system. And then that state evolves over time. Okay? Um, stocks are distinguished by the fact they can be measured in an incident time. You could freeze the current system 
as it were, and go count the number of people who are susceptible, count the number of infected, count the number of recovered. If you had some magic way of testing someone's infection status, you could go and count them. At that instant in time, there's this many, is this, and um, count for each one how many there are. Okay, um, just like if we froze time, we could say how much water is there in a bathtub, how much water is there in a water heater, or what have you. It's, it's the amount that's in there one instant time. How much water is there in a lake? Right. Um, we could specify that. Um, stocks start with some initial value, and Thereafter, they are changed over time, but they're changed in one mechanism. And that mechanism, ladies and gentlemen, is flows. They change via flows. We, we don't specify, typically in these models, we're not explicitly specifying a formula giving the value of the stock at a given time. That formula is implicitly specified by specifying the flows into and out of it. And it changes according to the net flow. If the net flow is in, in other words, if the net flow is greater than zero, we have more things, a faster rate of things coming in than things leaving. Think about water coming into your bathtub faster than it's draining. The value of the stock will go up. And if it's draining faster than it's coming in, the value of the stock will go down. Right. Um, tend towards... Uh, it will tend the way of, of draining. Okay? Um, so if we want to specify the stocks in our model, we specify the initial value, and thereafter, their value is determined, and their variation from that initial value is determined just by the flows. Okay? We don't need to specify a formula. The stock has a value of 2015.34 at you know, time, whatever. We don't do that. We just specify the flows and we let her run. Okay. Um, stocks, interestingly, are the source of delay and the source of inertia in systems. Um, typically, in our actions, we can affect flows, it turns out. Those are the things that we can change. We can change how, much, how fast water is coming into the bathtub. We could change how fast it's draining from the bathtub by putting a plug in the, in the drain, or we can turn up the handle to make it come in faster. But we typically can't directly, instantly make the water disappear. Mm -hmm. This is almost a philosophical point. And in our policies that we undertake, we typically affect flows. We, we're, not, we're affecting the, the rate at which people are getting infected by encouraging good hand hygiene or by encouraging social distancing so people stay at home more, as they've done in Alberta during the height of the flu season. Um, we, we encourage people to change the behavior. That's changing the flows. That's changing how quickly people are getting infected. It's not changing the number of people who are infected. And that number of people who are infected, that's going to dominate for, for right now. Over time, it will that the change in the flow will tend to affect it. But there's inertia in the system. It kind of remembers. And just like your tub, when you remove that drain plug, it'll take a while to drain out. So it is with a lot of systems. They have this inertia. The, the amount of water that's in that bathtub will determine things for the next few minutes. We can't just wish it away. Okay. Stock and flow diagrams, stocks are shown as rectangles. We're going to see these illustrations of some of these points, but it's good to keep in mind. So here are some examples of stocks. Water and tub and a reservoir. I've talked about that. Money in a bank account, right? We can affect the flows. We can affect how quickly we're earning money. We can affect how quickly we're spending money. Um, and that... Uh, Brings money in, takes money out. Um, blood sugar, the amount of, for those who are diabetic, the amount of um, sugar in your blood you can affect. You can you can exercise more and start to bring it down. You can, you know, eat jelly beans and start to bring it up. But it's uh, it's it's something which you can affect through uh, through flows. But it's at a current point in time you can measure blood sugar. At a current point in time you can measure bank account. At a current point in time. Freezing time, we can measure the amount of water in a tub, and we could ask how many people are susceptible, infected, and recovered right now. 
We can ask how many people are in this room right now? How many people are in an emergency room right now? How many cars are in the you know, Ford assembly line right now, right? How many cars are in the used car market right now? How many stockpiled vaccines are there right now? These are things you can measure. And so in, in uh, stock and flow models, we denote these, as I said, with rectangles, and they're denoted here. So here we see a division of the population into a set of categories, susceptible, affected, and, and uh, temporarily moved. And then we have one stock that isn't a division of the population. It's just recording over time um, the number of cumulative illnesses. And we might have, I really should have put in this diagram, probably for next iteration of this class, I will, I should have a one that's uh, total cost accumulated. Mm -hmm. um, because there's nothing about these diagrams that they, they can only be for one sort of thing. No, you can have cost, you can have dollars in one part, and life years lived in another, and people in another, and you know, dogs in another one, or, or whatever. Um, you can, you can have uh, stocks denoting very different things. It's not necessarily divisions of a, of a population. Okay, so I talked about stocks determine the current state of the system. They give the status of the system, the current situation. You can use different terms for it. It means right now, what is the situation? And in these sort of models, that's all you have to remember. If you wanted to sort of pack away that model and start it running again tomorrow, all you'd have to remember is the stocks. That's it. The stocks will specify their implications. They'll have their natural implications. It's kind of like if I specified where a ball is on an inclined plane right now. I could take it away. I could put it back there um, and, uh, and uh, start, it, start it up. It'll have that same potential energy. Should note that, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put aside the issues if it was already in motion, which is a different matter. OK. Um, Okay, stocks are central to most disequilibria. This is really interesting. So when we see disequilibria, we see phenomena that are um, where a system is undergoing dynamics that are different than a sort of long-term behavior. We see things like uh, business cycles. Um, when we see uh, when we see sort of a, a capacitor discharge for those of you who are from engineering background. Um, when we see a um, see a, uh, you know, a person uh, reacting to a drug they've just taken. These are just equilibrium phenomena. And um, you know, there's a buildup, a decay, an accumulation, uh, sometimes uh, issues with memory or hysteresis. We use different terms for this in different domains. But, but stocks, the current state of the system is central to this. So there, there's a sort of inertia. And they give rise to delays. It takes time to change things because of stocks. We can't instantly change how many people out there are, are infected. We can only change that over time by encouraging people to be careful. And so for a certain amount of time, we're going to have to put up with, you know, that a lot of people are still sick. We're not going to be able to wipe out diabetes. Even if we could stop new diabetes from being formed, there are people with diabetes already that we're going to have to care for for decades and decades. Um, there's people with chronic kidney disease from diabetes that we're going to have to deal with for many, many years. We can't instantly change that. All we can do is change the flows into that. Okay, so let's talk about these flows that I've been referring to. State changes in these systems are affected through flows. Stocks represent the state of the system. Flows represent the change in that state over time. And they're always expressed as in terms of something per unit time. Example, we would measure the flow of the South Saskatchewan River just outside the doors of this university. We'd be talking about it cubic meters per second, for example. Or we could express it in liters per year. Or we could express it in, you know, cubic, cubic uh, milliliters per century. But it's always something per unit time, okay? Um, uh, and in that sense, it's hard. If, if we froze time, we wouldn't be able to exactly measure just how fast that's flowing. We couldn't go out and say, how fast is the river flowing at, at one instant of time? To figure out how fast it's flowing, 
you often need to actually integrate it up through some period of time. You put a, you know, if you want to figure out how fast water is coming out of your well as you're pumping. Some years ago I did this. My neighbors helped me drive a sandpoint well in my acreage. And so I wanted to find out how fast it was pumping. So I was pumping, and of course what happened is they took a bucket of known size and they saw how long it took me to fill it up, right? They said, oh, you're pumping. You know, 10 liters per, per minute or what have you. Um, and it's a lot faster than that. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's how we, we figure out how fast the flow rate is um, within these systems. Um, if we want to figure out the rate of the South Saskatchewan River, we can do some experiments with things that keep track of the water as it go past. But it would be hard to measure it um, for an instant in time. We need to do something over time. Okay, and so a flow is expressed per unit time. We can't measure it at an instant in the same way we can with a stock. Okay, um, so in software engineering, for example, we have a bug fix rate, right? How many bugs are fixed per week? And to figure out how, what that rate is, we could look at one week of time and say, oh, we fixed 50 bugs in this week, right? Um, if we... Uh, if we talk about incidence rate in epidemiology, we're talking about the, the uh, number the number of incident cases that have accumulated, say, over the year, divided by the total number at risk. Um, if, if we want to talk about project velocity, again, in software engineering, number of jelly beans per day that people are accomplishing, um, or burn rate in a small company, how quickly they're going through money, the amount of money they spend per month or what have you, right? These are all flows, dollars per unit time. They're not stocks. If we froze time, we wouldn't be able to measure them, but they change over time, and they're going to affect stocks. Uh, they're going to affect stocks eventually. So, so flows, inflow or outflow from a bathtub, right? Liters per minute, rate of bug fixes, bugs per week, rate of code production, lines of code per month. Rate of incident cases, people per month. Rate of mortality, people per year. Rate of births, babies per year. Right? Rate of treatment, people per day. These are all flows. Mm -hmm. um, in electrical systems, we have power measured in watts compared to the energy, um, for example. Revenue, dollars per month. Flows, consistently flows. So how do we denote flows in these diagrams? We denote them in this way we see here. So here we have the stocks and the flows are what flow into or out of the stocks. And they're what determine the changes in those stocks over time. Now, what is it determines the rate of the flows, ladies and gentlemen? The stocks. It's a sort of yin-yang relationship. One determines the other. Um, the current situation determines the rate of flow. Think about your bathtub determines how quickly the water is rushing out of it. Bathtub, and of course, other factors are involved, how wide the drain is and so on. The rate of that bath, the, the height of that bathtub, if it's if it's if you've got an o furrow at home and it's one meter deep, it's going to be rushing out of there faster than if it's one inch deep. Um, so the value of that stock determines the rate of flow. And the rate of flow determines the change in that stock over time. Mm -hmm. The value of the flow determines the net flow into and out will determine the value of the stock over time. So here we have some flows. For example, infectious, number of infectious people. That's a stock. That's a stock. And then we have some flows into and out of it, right? Under what conditions will the number of infectious people be rising, folks. Sorry? Okay, there are flows in, and there's flows out. Under what condition would it would it be rising? If think about your bathtub. Under what condition would your bathtub be rising? You've got water going in and water draining. Under what condition will it be rising? If yeah, if the rate of new infections People per week, say. You can measure it in a number of different ways. People per day, people per week, people per microsecond. Um, some might be more convenient um, uh, numerically. And so uh, 
you know, the rate of new infections, people per day, is greater than the rate of new recoveries, people per day, then, then infections will be going up. If they're exactly equal, it will be doing what? Staying the same. Think about your bathtub. Three, you've got 20 liters per minute coming in, 20 liters per minute going out. It's going to be staying the same. It's in equilibrium. And if it's going out faster than it's coming in, you have it declining, right? Okay. Um, now, we can conceptually, this is a little bit subtle. We can conceptually ask about the flow at a given, about this flow rate at any given time. We could ask right now, what's the rate of flow of this South Saskatchewan River? And we could ask, how does that change by season? And, you know, during spring melts, is it larger than now? But typically to measure it, we, we think about measuring over time. Like if we were to go be frozen in time and we were to go look at that river, we, we can't quite tell. It's not, it's not moving. So how do I tell how fast it's going, right? Um, uh, to measure, we'd have to do so over some period. But conceptually, we can think of it as, okay, right now it's moving at a certain rate. Just to quantify that, we need to, we need to sort of integrate it up, right? Um, so when speaking about rates, and when speaking about rates of flows, we mean a rate of change over time, something like, you know, uh, so if it's a flow in, if, it's, if we have a flow in to number of infectious cases, and number of infectious cases is people, then the flow in has to be in people per some unit of time, right? That unit of time could be week, or per, could be month, or it could be day, but it's, it's per unit of time. Um, one warning here. Very commonly, when we talk about rates, these are rates in a sense, something per unit of time. An example would be, um, in an interest rate. Um, and I, in fact, had in my earlier slides uh, quite a number of, of other rates. So rate of a spending rate or rate of pregnancies, rate of births, rate of mortality. <laughs> These are common, common rates per unit time, right? But not all things that are rates are, that are termed rates where that term is used are automatically. Used. So like an exchange rate. Why isn't an exchange rate a flow? How, how, what would be a sort of signal that it's not a flow, that it's not a flow that we have to be suspicious of being a flow? Well, it could be a fixed constant value. Be... Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it, it, it it's a fixed constant value, but it's it could be. But the point is, that it's not quantified. The units of it, the dimensions of it, aren't per unit time. They're not. You could say the exchange rate to the Canadian dollar to the U.S. dollar is point eight nine or something like that, and it's. It's nothing like per day. There's no per day involved or per year involved. It's just it's a it's it's a quantity without that change per per unit time. There's no change over time. Um, similarly, for those from epi, epi background familiar with this prevalence rate, the fraction of the population that's infected, that's not a rate in a flow sense. An incidence rate is what fraction of all those people at risk has, has gotten infected within the past week or what have you, et cetera. Um, okay, so I have three ways of distinguishing stocks and flows, um, three tests. One is a snapshot test. If you were to only consider a moment of time, could you, could you assess that? Could you quantify that? Um, just a total snapshot of the current situation um, could you figure out, is that information uh, available to you? If so, then it suggests a, a stop. You could go and you could look, how many people are in the emergency room right now? But you can't ask how many people, have, how, many, how fast are people arriving? Mm -hmm. Okay, time unit test. If we were to change the unit of time from year to month to day, would the value have to change? Mm -hmm. If you were to say, that's good. Saskatoon is having lots of births. You say, oh yeah, how many, how many births are there? 25. 25 per day or per month or per year? Um, per second? Um, you know, it's gonna make a big difference, right? I mean, for uh, if for 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 a true rate, a true flow, change per unit of time. If you change the, the measure of time, it's going to have to change. Would exchange rate necessarily change? If we said 
we're going to be talking about years, we're going to be talking about days. It, it doesn't change. Yeah. Would you say that you could, you could conceptually ask you can. the flow of the unit time? You can ask about what its value is at this time, but that at that time, it doesn't require mentioning the time unit. You know, in other words, we could say, what is the what is the value of uh, what is the, the rate of the Saskatchewan River flows uh, 20 days from now, right? Or let's suppose 14 days from now, I could say, how fast is the Saskatchewan River going to be flowing? Or I could ask uh, two weeks from now, how fast is the Saskatchewan River going to be flowing? Um, or I could ask, you know, whatever it would be. Um, uh, two divided by 52, um, you know, years from now, how fast is the rate of the Saskatchewan River going to be flowing? Those are different units of time I'm talking in terms of, but I'm talking at that instant, at common instant in time, how fast is it going to be flowing? Uh, that's uh, that that rate. Um, you now, if if I want to have a numeric quantity for that, it depends. In other words, if I want to say, what is the rate at which it's flowing in cubic meters per year, or cubic meters per day, or cubic meters per second, it's going to be very different. And that's that's this time unit change thing. I feel thing. like it conflicts with the snapshot test definition. No, no, because to assess the rate of flow of the Saskatchewan River at a snapshot in time, that would be very difficult to do. I could go out and I could look at the river at that instant in time, see each particle suspended, and how fast is it flowing? Well, I, I can't. Tell. It's, it's at that moment in time, and I'm not seeing it go past me. If you see what I mean, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it go down river in any way. So it's hard for me to tell if it's zooming past or if it's going really slow. Um, so the snapshot test is if we were to just freeze it and use only the information from this instant in time, could we assess a flow? No. Um, for 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 flows, we could for stocks. Time unit change, if we change our time unit from weeks to months to years with the numeric quantity change in the accumulation, uh, is it an accumulation of time varying values? Um, is it an accumulation of some quantity uh, over time? Uh, if so, it's it's a, a stock. Um, it's, it's accumulating that over time. Not sure if I answered your question. I'm glad to, to talk about it, but the the snapshot test um, really limits us to the information available at an instant, and uh, and that information is not enough to determine a, a rate of flow because we're not seeing the change at that instant. Does that, does that make some sense? Um, yeah, it makes, it makes some sense. Okay. It's just stuff like the definition mm. makes it like the, the, the seems like there's a conflict. Okay. So I'd love to talk to you about that and find sort of what it is so that I could refine these. Uh, that would be very helpful. Okay, I think we're uh, running out of time for today. I may ask you to undertake, like for this time, a small exercise, and, um, and then we can talk about it uh, next time. Okay. How are you doing? Thank you. Oh, wow. I, I forgot completely. Oh, no, it's like no problem. It may not be possible, but what, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll check. I'll yeah, I'll just you. give it a try. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm loving it. I, I've been coming. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah, see I did you. The oh, that's you over there. Yeah, yeah. I'm loving it. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Oh, wow. My pleasure. It's good to see you. Thank you. Bye. How was your time in uh, Mexico? Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah, a little bit too long, but you know, it's good to get home. Well. Yeah, you, you uh, remind me where you're from there? Mexico City. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, so wow. it was too crowded for me now, you know? Oh. Before when I used to go, yeah. I feel it like a real city or at home, and now I feel...